I'm really glad you're here because it's. Um, I know that a lot of DBAs, when we say Apache Kafka, they say, huh? And then they say real time, they say what? And so I'm kind of glad that, uh, to see that people are interested and see that it's an important topic. It is important because the whole data warehouse and BI worlds are changing really, really fast. And I mean, I was prepared to say that the world in which you update your data warehouse once a day and then you run reports once a day and that's how your business runs is no longer enough. People want to see data in different pace and be able to adapt to a fast changing world. But then earlier in breakfast, someone explained that he's actually only refreshing his BI reports once a month. And I'm like, how can you run a business when you don't know about your sales, your financial status, your uh, billing, anything until the end of the month. And like, well, why would you need it in the middle of the month? Like, well, to adjust course, to make better decisions. Like, no, no, the end of the month is fine. So I think most businesses are not at a place where, oh, the end of the month is absolutely fine. They really do want to act faster on data. So I'm going to talk a lot about that. So I'll talk about stream processing, also known as uh, real-time analytics, and I'll tell you why it's important and why it matters. And then I'll tell you about what is Apache Kafka, which is the open source project that makes the real-time processing a thing. I mean, I think Oracle has been talking about CEP, the complex event processing, what allows you to process data in real time for a while now. But there was a reason it wasn't catching on. And it's because there wasn't any place to actually store and manage those streams of data. And Apache Kafka, as an open source uh, project, actually gives you that. So we're going to talk about how Apache Kafka enables all those new use cases. And then I'll talk a bit, and really a bit, maybe a slide or two, about how if you want to do something about it, if you want to try to do stream processing, if you want to try to take your ETL real time, where does it go? So stream processing is, first of all, really, really hot. It's like one of those things that if you go to a lot of the big data conferences, that's all they talk about anymore. It's like uh, I was at Strata and one of the organizers was like, you know, we're called Strata and Hadoop world, but nobody really wants to hear about Hadoop anymore. They all want to hear about Spark. They all want to hear about things that are more real time which is kind of worrying for a conference that talks about uh, Hadoop. I'm sure they will adapt. Hadoop has been a very flexible word for so far, but clearly trying to do processing in real time is where the world is going. And the way we see it is that there is a, a we don't see it as exactly a system, more as a way of processing data. So one way of processing data would be a request response. That's how all TP systems do it, right? There's someone with a question, or I want to buy this, and you go to the database and say, how many of X do we have? Or uh, how much does X cost? Or let's, make, let's update X to, to, uh, to say that I bought something. And you need to respond in milliseconds. And it has to be very consistently millisecond level response. And that's why all TP and kind of the online applications really work. And then there is batch, right? You, pro you take a day of data or an hour of data or in some bad cases, a month of data. You take it out of one database, you load it into another, you create a big report and you wait for the next hour or the next day to do it all over again. Uh, but obviously somewhere between uh, two milliseconds consistently and every day, but if you miss it by a few hours, no big deal. There is a huge variety of other stuff that can happen. And what we call real-time ETL and what we call stream processing is really a place in that continuum. So when we talk about stream processing, we're talking about a world where the data arrives at its own pace. Basically, things happen when they happen. Uh, people do sales and sales happen when sales happen. Uh, trucks go around the highway, taxis pick off uh, people and drop them off. And all these events just happen at their own rate. There is nothing in the system that enforces those activities. And then we also have a system that processes the data and it processes it at its own rate. Sometimes you need to see results every second. Sometimes you need it every five minutes. Sometimes you only need results uh, when something big happens. So you can uh, process the data uh, at, at any pace because the, the data arrives at its own rate and is stored in a data store. Uh, but it, you process it continuously. 
So unlike in batch where you only process data once a day or in ODP when you only process data when someone asks for it, you decide how fast you want to process data and then you basically endlessly continue processing all the data as it arrives because the data never stops arriving. Sales don't just happen at midnight, they happen throughout the day. You keep on processing the sales throughout the day. The results are available as soon as you finished processing them but nobody really waits for a specific result. Again, unlike in OLTP where you ask a question, you need a specific answer the moment you ask for it, uh, you publish sales aggregates, like you keep updating how many sales we did this month, and when people come in, they see an updated uh, result in the database. And data can be available in, within milliseconds after it happened, or maybe within minutes, probably not as long as an hour. So you have a different timestamp to play with. And the idea is that uh, if you look at an example, then you look at a retail business. That's a pretty good uh, example. Uh, we, and I just talked about it and I have a cool story that maybe we'll share it just tomorrow. But the idea is that you have a business, so imagine Walmart or Target or one of those, and they keep doing sales, right? So sales is events that are going into the system continuously all the time. Shipments keep happening, right? Uh, trucks leave, that, leave their warehouses, physical warehouses, not data warehouses, have trucks leave with goods, they drop goods off at stores, so the inventory keeps getting updated. This shipment happened, and then this one, we ran out of this thing. And all those updates happen continuously. So the inventory adjustments, whenever a shipment happens, whenever sales happen, we have to update the inventory. We don't do it once a day, we do it when it happens. Same for price adjustments. If we want to do a sale because something is not selling as we expected, we can reduce the prices in real time for one store, for all stores. We don't have to wait to the end of the month to find out, oh, we didn't manage to sell anything. We have to adjust prices now. You can do it in real time as the data shows up. And then you also have outputs of data. You do analytics. And the same, in the same rate that data flows into the system, you have analytics, aggregates, averages, uh, sums of things just flow out. If you do any kind of fraud detection, which is in retail is obviously a very big deal, you have ev events come in, they're being continuously evaluated, and notifications about possible fraud show up in someone's uh, system continuously. So the world is kind of changing, right? Because we used to treat the business as either super urgent, response has to be right now within milliseconds or things will blow up, or we don't really care until the next day or the next month. But the truth is that most of the business would be somewhere in between, right? Very few things are so urgent that you really have to respond immediately. Sales may be the only thing that is really that critical. Uh, but most things can't really wait for the next business day or business, the business people don't really want to wait for the next day. They want to look at newer data. So a lot of things are in between. And the, we think that this, viewing a business as a stream of event, other than a series of tables and kind of snapshots at where the business was every day, you get a different snapshot of the state of the business, but you don't get any of the in-between state. Uh, we think that uh, looking at businesses as streams of things that are continuously happening and processed as they're happening is just a more correct way of looking at businesses. So the way databases evolved, right, businesses used to have probably like account books and people would write things down and uh, at the end of the month process those books. And then we build databases, we kind of just took those books and turned them into tables. And they think stayed that way for a really long time, but it feels like in many senses, people are not happy with just having those tables that represent books, but they want something that's more active and dynamic because computers now allow things to be that active and that dynamic. So I hope I convinced you that streams are really, really important. And that's where I do a abrupt transition to talk from the big ideas to kind of the technologies that enables the whole thing. So let's take a look at Apache Kafka. Apache Kafka is really, really hard to describe because it's not really a database and it's not really a message system. It's not really a file system. We see it as a cross between, it's definitely not a database, nothing like it. It's a cross between a messaging system. Uh, if any of you used uh, published subscribe message queues, things like Tipco, ActiveMQ, MQ series, RabbitMQ. Am I ringing any bells here? Anything? Okay, yes, we know what we're talking about, cool. 
Uh, so if you use those, Kafka is a bit like that. You publish events to it and you have consumers who subscribe to events and get updates. But it's also a file system in the sense that it keeps events forever. Even after everyone read events, they're still kept. Well, not forever. You define how long you want to keep them. But unlike uh, most message queues where you ever, the consumers got the data, it's basically gone. Kafka stores the data forever or close to forever. And this allows you to treat it as a data store for events, right? Because you publish events, people get them. But if someone joins later and want to see all the events from the beginning of the month, well, those events are still there. They didn't go anywhere. And the basic idea behind Kafka is that of a log. And we kind of accidentally stumbled into it, but logs are hugely important in the sense that all data systems are really logs. Like obviously, if you have an application, you write stuff to a log in order to debug it later. You use Oracle, you have the Oracle alert log. Pretty much every application in the world has a log. If you use Oracle as a database, well, you know that Oracle is really a read log, right? I mean, that's like the basis of everything that is done in Oracle will be written to a read log. And that's apparently true for pretty much every database in the world, no matter how weird it is. No matter which NoSQL system you used, if you ask them about the write ahead log, they'll say, I have a write ahead log. If you use MySQL, you'll have a bin log. If you use a SQL Server, you have a transaction log. Uh, Agebase, Cassandra, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, HDFS, no matter how weird the way of storing data is, you'll have a log in there. So it's a great way of actually integrating a lot of really weird databases together and say they're all logs. Let's just treat them as copying data from one log to another and look at everything that way. So Oracle is a system of managing logs of events. So a bit less like a log of uh, you know, er the alert log and a bit more like the Oracle read log. And if you understand logs, that's pretty much what you need to understand in order to understand Kafka. So that makes life, I'm kidding, right? I mean, conceptually, right? The same way that you can understand tables perfectly, and then you still have like a few years of learning before you can manage an Oracle database. Uh, that's pretty much how uh, or, uh, Kafka and logs are. Uh, the same way that in order to, you cannot understand the relational database without understanding tables. And the moment you understand tables and the relationships between tables, you know most of what you need in order to start working with the database. Kafka is the same way about logs. If you understand logs, you're ready to start using a Kafka. There is still a distance between that and being like a certified Kafka admin, which is not currently a thing. I don't think anyone offers certifications, but <laughs> yes. Um, at some point, I'm sure someone will offer certifications, but it's not, not even close to being a thing. Uh, so, Let's reiterate about logs. So logs are important in databases for recovery, right? Everything you do in a database goes to the reader log, and that's the kind of the source of truth for a database, right? So if you recover, you recover the data files, but then you have to apply logs in order to get it to a usable state. And the reason you have to do it is because the log is the only reliable source of information about your database. Why is that the only reliable source of information? Because if you look at data files and you try to do something with them, either they have data that was not committed yet because you know the DB writer flashed stuff to disk and didn't bother telling anyone about it, uh, or sometimes uh, stuff was uh, happens was committed but was not flashed to disk yet. So the process of updating the data files is completely asynchronous. What is happening synchronously is updating the log. Why is updating the log so synchronous? Because a log is a, ser a file written serially to a disk, so it's really, really fast to write to it. You don't have to look around in the disk for the right block in which to write the data. You can write it to it really fast. Oracle knows it, so every writing to the reader log is kind of a blocking operation. You have to wait for it to happen when you commit a transaction. So it becomes the reliable source of truth about the database. And basically in Kafka we said, well, if a log is such a reliable source of truth about the world, why do we need a database? So obviously you need a database for a lot of things. You need a database to run queries and uh, be efficient and have indexes and do stuff in memory and all kinds of stuff. Uh, but it is also true that having just a log already gives you a lot. So Kafka was a system built to manage those logs. It, so we take those logs of events that happened to our business, and we start by saying, okay, 
A single log can grow pretty big because we store it forever and it's our, data, it's our database. So obviously in order to fit it, it may not fit in a single disk. It may not fit in a single machine. So we have to find a good way to cut it up and we just do a partitioning. So we store, a, we have kind of a logical breakup of logs based on a certain attributes the developer uses, but we partition the data so we can split it across many machines. In the database world, it's not really analogous to partitions, it's more like uh, shards. So you say, we have this one logical table uh, that has details about my customers, but we say customers A to Z are in this table, customers, uh, sorry, A to M are in this database, and then customers uh, M to Z are in the other database, and we kind of split them apart in order to scale better. It's a distributed system. So you can have a single logical Kafka cluster that is made of a lot of machines. And we take all those logs, we uh, partition them, we split them across the machines, and then we replicate them. So if one machine goes down, you still have good copies and you continue working. And we, get, we did a lot of work just making it really, really fast. So you can write uh, about a million events per second, even to a relatively mod modest machine. You can, uh, you expect latencies within milliseconds when you write events, it should be very, very high performance. And the way we see it, those logs are basically streams of events and Kafka stores those logs. And it basically allows you to start saying, I want to start processing events in a specific point in time and just move on and continue getting the updates. And that brings us back to the idea that events show up and you don't query for them. They just, you're a consumer, you're a subscriber of the log. You just keep, start reading at some point and you keep getting newer and newer events and you keep on processing because the business never stops, sales never stop. You keep getting an update and do your, whatever work you need to do, you do it on them. Uh, so what is this stream processing I keep talking about? Well, stream processing is really simple. You have a stream of events, you read an event, you do some kind of modification on it, and you output the event somewhere else. Um, so it can be super simple, and most of you may already be doing stream processing without even knowing about it. So the most canonical database example is the database uh, CDC, change log capture, right? So you have something mining read logs out of a relational database, and you, it keeps on getting new updates as the log, uh, as things happen to the database. And you basically take the event out of the database. The simplest thing is just to put it in another database. But usually you do something to it, right? You may be changing a bit the structure a bit. You do some ETL to the event. Sometimes you filter some, some of the events, uh, all kinds of, if you use uh, Golden Gate, you do all kinds of stuff of the change log. Uh, so any kind of change log based ETL is absolutely stream processing. So maybe some of you already use Golden Gate or even Oracle Xtremes to do some of that. And one of the good questions that I always get when I do this presentation is that if we use Kafka for change data capture, so if we take events using, for example, Golden Gate, we take events out of Oracle, we put them in Kafka, and then we have a program read the events of Kafka, process them, and output them something else, does it mean that Kafka is ACID? Is it reliable enough to drive a business out of? And that's a really good question because it means that, it, the actual question is what guarantees does Kafka give me? Is it safe enough? And Kafka actually gives really good guarantees. So if you go over ACID, ACID means atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. Uh, so the easiest one is durability. And Kafka absolutely guarantees durability. So you have the concept of data that was committed to Kafka, which means that the producer got an acknowledgement that it got written. This data is not going away. So it's not going to get lost. So you get the durability. Uh, you have something called read consistency, meaning that the moment you wrote something to Kafka and you got an acknowledgement that it got written, other people can uh, read it and we'll always read it and read it consistently and we'll never have any of those is this event there, not there kind of things that some NoSQL database give you. Like if you read data off the wrong machine, you will not see data that was actually written. We don't have any of that. Um, we have some kind of atomicity in the sense that events either get written or not, but we don't have atomicity in the sense that you cannot have a transaction that has multiple events. So we kind of don't have that. Uh, we are working on editing it though, so that's something that will show up. 
And uh, real database consistency is a bit more complicated, right? Because it talks about uh, foreign keys being kept consistent across the transaction. Uh, we don't have foreign keys, we don't have real database consistency. And isolation, that's actually one of the nice things that uh, are true in Kafka. And if you wrote an event, until the, the producer got an acknowledgement saying, hey, it was written, nobody else will see the event. So you cannot, uh, if uh, you cannot, you don't have dirty reads where you can see something and then later it will go away because the transaction uh, blew up. So you got pretty good guarantees and obviously if you work with a system in general, not just Kafka, it's really important to understand the guarantees and ask about them and even do your own tests to investigate them. A lot of uh, my customers, they basically set up a small Kafka cluster, they produce events, numbers one, two million, just have something keeps writing numbers to Kafka, and then they have a bunch of uh, consumers read the numbers from Kafka, and they start crashing machines in the middle, and pulling up network plugs, and doing all sorts of crazy stuff to see what happens. Like, they, and they, you reason about it in your mind, you say, okay, what I think will happen is that the producer will not get an acknowledgement, it will retry, and only a few seconds later the consumer will get it once the uh, transaction stabilizes, and you need to see that this is what happened. Okay, so we got the idea that streams are really important, I hope. We got the idea that Kafka collects logs and logs are actually streams. Uh, so how does Kafka help? Like, why do I need Kafka if I want to do real-time processing? Well, it starts with the question of how the hell do we do stream processing anyway? And there is uh, three common methods to do it. And the first one is what I call hipster stream processing. Uh, how many of you know what I mean by hipster? Okay, kinda. Okay, I'm from San Francisco. Hipsters are a really big deal in San Francisco. Uh, really young guys with really strange fashion sense. And one of the things they value is uh, minimalism. They want, they want everything to be minimal and simple, which I understand, I value that as well. They tend to take it to extremes. So they have those bikes, very old school, they're called fixie bikes, where they pretty much took everything out of the bike. So they not only they have no gears, I get bikes with no gears, they also have no freewheel, which means that you cannot stop, if the bike is moving, you have to keep moving your legs. You cannot just, they don't detach, you can't just coast like a normal person down a hill. You have to keep spinning your legs. And they also don't have brakes, because apparently brakes are not strictly necessary, because if you have a freewheel, you can kind of force your uh, pedals backward and kind of, yeah, in San Francisco. You get it, guys, <laughs> totally. So it works fantastic. It's simple, it doesn't break, very reliable, looks fantastic, very fashionable, until you get to the first hill. And in San Francisco, it takes you about five milliseconds to get to the first hill. And then it's horrible in all kinds of directions. Um, and hipster stream processing is a bit like that. It's really, really minimal. You say, oh, I just need to read some data from uh, Kafka, do something small to it, and produce it somewhere, and uh, write it somewhere. I don't need much to do it, right? I can write code in Python, or whatever my favorite language. If you're a hipster, you do it in Go, I think, or Rust, or one of those hipster languages. <laughs> uh, so you read data from Kafka, you do something to it, to write it. It works fantastically well until you get to the first hill, your first hill will be either a join or an aggregate, anything that requires you to store state, in which case things all blow up because, okay, if I have state, do I write it to a separate disk? How do I manage it? Do I need a database for my state? Uh, how, what happens if I crash? How do I know what point to come back to in the log and how it works with the state? It gets really, really complicated the moment you do anything that is not filter or a very simple single event transformation. So once people figure that out, they go to a stream processing framework. That's an, not even close to an exhaustive list of all the stream processing frameworks out there. Anything that would be an exhaustive list, as, actually as I was typing this, someone sent me a paper about yet another stream processing framework that someone invented. I completely gave up on following those. There are like pages on pages of different ones. The popular ones are Storm, which is kind of the legacy. Pretty much anyone who did stream processing up until this year has it in Storm. Spark is the up-and-comer system. And that's the, if anyone is building stream processing now, they are 100% using Spark streaming. Like every single customer I talked to in the last year, that's what they're doing. And then uh, Samza is a 
kind of uh, new and all the rest are much newer and haven't seen that much adoption either. So I'm not going to go into them. So obviously few of them are really popular. And the pros are they can handle really hard problems. They can do the aggregates for you. They can do moving averages over different windows of time. They do joins, they do a lot of stuff that's really non-trivial. And the cons is that it can lead to very complex architectures. And this is the kind of thing I mean by very complex architecture. It's a fraud detection system that I actually built with some of my colleagues about uh, close to, not quite a year ago. And you can see that it has a lot of moving parts. And the reason it has all those moving parts is that you need them. You need HBase to maintain state. You need Flume for the ingest. You do Spark streaming kind of on the side. You need Solar. You need HDFS. You need all those different things. And as you can see, I, I built this architecture because I thought it was best of breed. I thought I was doing good work for my client. And I can justify every single component of it. I can tell you why I need HBase. I can tell you why I need Flume on the ingest. But as the result is that something that I, I felt bad leaving the customer because I left him with something really, really messy to maintain when all they really needed is something fairly simple. They have inputs, they have the sales, they have the, I think in that case it was network monitoring system. So they have people accessing the network in different ways and they have devices and they have few rules on how to treat events that happen on those devices. And so we needed a way to get those. We needed some processing, and we wanted to write an output to a database. It shouldn't be rocket science. Why did I end up with something so complicated? So we really wanted to simplify it, and we kind of came up with Kafka Streams, which has, I can't say it's strictly better than everything other stream processing as out there, because having a framework does have some benefits, but we try to make it a lot simpler. So first of all, it uses Kafka. Everyone uses Kafka, but we think we're doing it a lot better. It has no framework in the sense that, oh, you need to learn Spark streaming. You need to learn Storm. There's not much to really learn there. And it allows you to do something really cool about unifying tables and streams in a way that really makes sense in the database world. So let me go over those. First of all, do all stream processing systems use Kafka? The answer is yes. Every single one of them uses Kafka because that's the only reliable way to get events. There is no other way for events to really show up in the system. So they all end up using uh, Kafka, which is, by the way, welcome to the amazing world of big data. You use things that were written by your competitors. Uh, so a lot of the people who write stream processing systems are actively competitors with my company that maintains Apache Kafka. And they still use what we write because they kind of need it. So it's, the world is funny that way. How do those systems use uh, Kafka? Well, they use it for the partitioning and for scalability. And the way Kafka works is that you have a log in Kafka and the log is partitioned. And when you consume data from Kafka, you have consumer groups. So suppose that you have a log that gets millions of events per second, like let's say one million events per second. And you have something that processes data, but no matter how optimal you try to make it, you can only process 100,000 events per second. And that's actually pretty good. But you cannot go anymore. Why can't you go anymore? Because you're writing to an Oracle database, and that's how fast you manage to write to a database. Because it's a very busy database, you cannot write any faster than that. Uh, well, that means that uh, if in order to do million events per second, I, and if I can only process 100,000 events per second, I need to somehow run 10 of those 100,000 events per second uh, processing systems in parallel. And this is what we do here. So group A, imagine it's uh, processors writing from Kafka to an Oracle database or to HDFS. Uh, you, we have three of those writing in parallel and they automatically balance the work between them. That's one of the cool things Kafka will do to you. It will automatically balance, if you have more things writing, reading from the same topic, you'll just uh, balance the work among them. And you can have two different groups. So one of them is writing to Oracle and the other is writing to say Cassandra. And each one of them will get all the data, but the members of the group will uh, split up the work. So that's pretty cool and that's something that Kafka gives uh, yeah. Question. Um, so does this does Kafka only work for um, like databases, like relational databases, or does it work well for you know, like web? Um, you so know, yeah, Kafka itself doesn't care what the data you store in there. 
that's part of the coolicity. So it's very, very common to have a Kafka pipeline without any database involved at all. So if you look at Uber, for example, they have uh, data, basically the cars send, continuously send information to a web application. The web application sends data to Kafka. They have Samza as their stream processing of choice, processing data of uh, Kafka, and then writing data back to Kafka, which the web applications that the cars talk to subscribes to, so it can actually pipe data back to the cars. And that's how surge pricing, as my absolutely favorite and least favorite Kafka use case uh, works. You want to tell all the drivers that, hey, you actually get more money now. When do you do it? When there is more demand than uh, cars. How do you know? Well, because you get all those events, you have all those requests for more cars, you have all those information about which cars are picking up passengers, you know you're short of uh, cars, you can decide, hey, new price, you put the new price on the website, and all everyone who tries to book a car now gets the update immediately. It's so. Yeah, that's exactly what Samza is doing. Is the surge pricing being calculated in the Sansa? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it does. Yeah, I keep having kind of dreams of putting a hack in Kafka to exempt me from search pricing, but I haven't found a really stealthy way to do it yet. <laughs> I will absolutely let you know when I, when I figure it out. What, what if it was like video data or some kind of other, like not, like, you know, S-based or data and non? Yeah, some data is not a good fit into uh, Kafka, and one of them, video can get large. Kafka deals way better with a huge number of tiny messages than huge messages. So I could imagine working with a customer figuring out how to do video, but that would not be um, like, I, I would not say, oh, that's a natural use case. It will totally work out of the box. The other things that Kafka in recent versions give stream processing that is really important is the idea of time. And it turns out that time is way more complicated than everything we imagined. So for example, the talk is recorded. So I say something right now, but if someone watches the recording, he may watch it um, a month later. What is now? Is it now now or a month later now? Fantastic question. And it's something that it, it sounds theoretical and kind of interesting for philosophers. But the thing is that one of the more challenging projects I worked on was uh, trying to get debugging information for cellular networks. So cellular networks have all those towers with devices on them. Uh, if you're like T-Mobile or AT&T, right? And those devices send information uh, to back to their uh, home base, T-Mobile headquarters or AT&T headquarters. And using this information, you can say when a device needs maintenance. But a lot of times the device, for a bunch of reasons, cannot report data back. Uh, maybe there is a storm that took out all electricity in the region for three days. Maybe it's so broken that it can't even connect back to tell you it's broken. So, or maybe just something momentarily just blocked the view. There was like a large plane flying overhead or something like that. You cannot report back. And then it has to report information that is actually old. And when you do processing, you need to reconcile all the information with the new one, with new information. And that's fairly challenging. And that's one of the things that uh, actually Kafka does fairly well in the sense that if you just produce data to Kafka, it takes a timestamp at the moment that someone tries to do send. So when the data finally arrives, it arrives with the original timestamp, maybe from three hours earlier, uh, that someone tries to send the data. And then when you do stream processing, say you're writing to a database, you're writing to a bunch of partitions, you know that you should do with this point data doesn't belong to the current partition, it belongs to partition three hours ago, and you can actually do the update or insert three hours ago. So you need to have some intelligence to do it, that's something that Kafka streams does automatically out of the box, in other frameworks you have to do it, but at least you have a chance because you have this information automatically. You don't have to worry about did the developer remember to do it or not. Um, another nice thing that we want to simplify things is the question of a framework. So if any of you worked with a Spark streaming, for example, you know that you need a Spark streaming cluster. So if you have something like, say, ODI uh, doing Spark streaming, you actually need to maintain Spark streaming cluster, send work to Spark streaming or send work to Hadoop, get back the result. 
it can get a lot complicated. And it means that there is a framework to monitor, to manage, and it means it has to know what to do when there's errors in the log. It can get complex. Uh, Kafka Streams is just a library. So you write your own app and you just um, import this library and use it to do a join. A bit like when you do SQL, you don't need a SQL running framework in addition to your database, right? You just write SQL. You just write code in this specific language that allows you to process the data. Kafka Streams try to do stream processing. The language is a lot different than SQL until we figure out how to do it in SQL. Uh, but the idea is that you don't need a special framework in order to run the queries is um, important. But the really exciting bit is that uh, we have how to reconcile the notion of a stream of events with the ideas of database tables. So streams are things that happen. They happen continuously. You have all those events coming in. Events don't change, right? If I say I bought shoes, I bought those shoes. It's a fact. It's never, ever going to change. If I return those shoes, well, I bought them, and then there's another event that I return them. If I later buy a different pair of shoes, well, I bought a different pair of shoes. Those are three different events. Though, uh, nothing will change the fact that I bought shoes even though I returned them. But if you have a table about the state of the inventory, those are three updates. And after you, when I uh, buy the shoes, well, you in, in, increase the number. When I return them, you, you increase, decrease do all those changes, but you always have one concrete state, which is usually a lot smaller than the set of events that changed it. Like a reader log will be a lot larger usually than the table it represents. And one of the challenges we had until now is that databases are only have states. You query a table, all you see is the current set of events. You don't see all the things that happened in order to get it to where it is today. On the other hand, if you look at the log, at the stream, you only see events. You don't have the end state. Okay, so Gwen bought shoes, returned shoes, bought different shoes, brought an umbrella. Fantastic, but what is the inventory right now? It's really hard to tell. You have to reconcile, it's not easy. But of course, we are able to reconcile it because databases are built on logs. And the way we do it is using apply and change capture. So if you have a stream of events, say the database read the log, in order to get it to a state, you keep applying those changes. Okay, I see an event that Gwen bought shoes, update this table. We see an event that Gwen returns them, update it again, update it again, and you have this table with all these events. The other way around, if you have a table, you can do a change capture and just uh, retain all the changes that happen to this table. A lot of time, I mean, you can think about it as the difference between uh, fact tables and dimensions in that warehouse. You can only think about different ways you manage slowly changing dimensions, right? Because sometimes you actually keep all the history in the dimension, and sometimes you decide to actually merge it and not keep all the history, and it's one of like those big decisions you do in a data warehouse, right? Do I keep all the history in my dimension or I don't? And there's tons of implications, and you read a necessary chapter in the Kimball book 15 times in a row, and you still can't figure it out. Uh, so. Maybe this is the kind of thing that helps you think about it, is that the changes are a stream of events, conceptually different than the state things are right now. And streams and tables sometimes look like the same thing, but sometimes they are very different. So if you do a filter on a stream and a filter on a table, you kind of get the same results, right? If you don't care about, if you only care about events, in North America, and you do a filter on the stream, and you'd only care about events in North, uh, about the state in North America, and you do a filter on the table, you kind of get the same thing. But if you do an aggregate, it can be very different, right? If you look at shoe sales based on a stream of events, you may end up with uh, three events where there was actually a single sale. So you need to be careful when you do aggregate. Stream aggregations will typically be very different than table aggregations. Okay, one last thing in order to have more or less of a complete picture is where do streams come from? Like how do we even start having streams? Well, we have a framework called Kafka Connect, which basically helps connect Kafka to the rest of the world. And there's a lot of places you can get data in from, in from and out of. Relational databases, you can get data in and out of. Key value stores, monitoring systems, search systems and so on, and we kind of built, it's built into Apache Kafka, like the open source Apache system, uh, this uh, framework for writing connectors, 
and we made it really, really, really easy to write connectors to different data stores. And as a result, this kind of exploded. And we currently have, and we only announced it like three months ago, and we currently have 30 different connectors for all kinds of use cases. So we have uh, connectors from Golden Gate and Attunity and DBVisit for all kinds of relational databases. And we have uh, connectors to Cassandra and MongoDB and Couchbase and Kudu and HBase and all, all kinds of uh, key value stores. Uh, we have connectors to weird stuff. We have someone who streams data from Bloomberg terminals into Kafka. And we have someone who streams data from Kafka to Twitter. So theoretically, you're about three clicks away from getting data from your Bloomberg terminal onto a Twitter. Uh, it's, uh, it's cool. I am super excited about, like, we, if you make something really easy for people to do, they do a lot of it. And the results are usually, I would have, you could have never paid me enough to write a Bloomberg terminal, anything, right? But people did it and they found it easy enough. They wrote it, they open sourced it. You can find it. I'll have a link to it in a few more slides. And the way we see the architecture is that you kind of stream data from a source, you do a bunch of processing, and then you stream data to wherever the data has to show up. So we call it a streaming data platform, and that's kind of our, the way it looks. Uh, you have all those uh, information flow again, you do all kinds of processing, some of it is in real time, some of it will maybe just dump data to a data warehouse for larger reports, dump data for, to Hadoop for all kinds of analytics, you can do a lot of cool stuff. That's a new slide. I wonder, can you see anything from over there? Uh, so our, our platform kind of has a GUI that allows you to add connectors, and you just kind of pick a connector out of the list and configure it. That's a JDBC. Here's the primary key. It's incrementing, so you can use it. Or here's a timestamp that you can use to get new data. Here's the queries that you want to use in order to filter some of the data. And then it's monitored. And that's really cool because it's monitored end to end. The big question you always have when you build those uh, pipelines is how do I trust that the end destination, that my data warehouse actually has all those events that I streamed in? That's always a big headache, and big headache for us, for our customers, for everyone. So we built something, it's, we call it an audit, except audit was a horrible name, so we called it a stream monitor. But the idea is that it is an audit. It's exactly like what accountants do. We count events as we write them in, so we say this second we wrote that many events and we keep counting them. And then when events get out, when people read them, we, say, we also count how many events were read per unit of time. And because we have the timestamps, we can say, okay, we got all the events, but they were delayed by five minutes. What happened? Or for this time period, we know we, say, we produced 200 events, but we only got 50 of them. Someone go check what happened to the other 50. Maybe there were bad data and they got thrown away. Maybe we had a filter we didn't know about. So you can kind of see that things don't match up. It's an audit because, you know, it's incoming, outgoing, match, match them up and see it all, how it all works. Okay, so some tips on how to get started. Uh, first of all, we have our Confluent platform that includes uh, Apache Kafka. So we welcome you to download. Free, open source, everything included. And then you go to the connector page and you pick the connectors. You want Oracle to Twitter. You want uh, Cassandra to S3, Bloomberg to um, ActiveMQ. I mean, there's just tons of those different things. You, and the, that's the nice thing about the connector ecosystem is that they all integrate, right? You don't have to worry about, okay, I can get out, out of Oracle, but does it mean that I can actually put it onto Hadoop? Will it all fit? And in our case, yes, it all fits. And we even do some cool stuff around evolving the schemas. So suppose that someone adds a, uh, adds a column to a table in Oracle, and you dump the data to Hadoop. And then you have a Hive table on Hadoop that kind of allows you, gives you the metadata for the Hadoop table. Uh, we actually know that you added a table because we see it in the data coming in. We can do an alter table on the Hadoop side to add the missing column so data will flow out and not break. So we have a lot of like, connector intelligence in there. And then once you have the connectors, you can start configuring the pipeline. And we have like a blog post showing you how to do that with the previously shown uh, cool GUI. Do you still have the intelligence if Golden Gate is a piece of the um, 
That's a good question. I think we cannot do that because of the way Golden Gate has formatting. With it's not actually all. The, we don't know that it's all the columns, right? So Golden Gate has a connector to Kafka, uh, but it has a interesting. One of the limitations of the connector is that if you do an update, it doesn't necessarily give you all the columns. It may only give you the key columns and then the columns that got updated. So we can just go and put that into Hadoop and put, do updates based on that because some columns may be missing but not actually gone from the table. Uh, so you need to do some processing. You need to have some kind of stream processor that can reconcile them, basically do the apply of the update and have some intelligence about Golden Gate in order to do it. it can, it's not going to be out of the box. And actually that sounds like a really, really necessary project because Golden Gate is becoming and Kafka becoming a very popular way to do change data capture and stream processing. And that's kind of a missing piece. So if someone writes it, it'll probably be pretty popular and it's Golden Gate. So you can probably charge money for it. <laughs> I mean, people who buy Golden Gate already spend their gazillion dollars. I mean, a few more bucks here and there probably be fine. <laughs> and that's where I'm kind of like, stop the recording, stop the recording. <laughs> uh, yes, that's exactly it. It wouldn't work, no. It requires a Apache Kafka 0.10. I'm sure that Kildare will get to 0.10 at some point, but I don't know when, when they're planning to do it. And they, when I ask, they don't tell me. Like, no, 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 you don't need to know. And then we have some stream processing examples. If, you, if it's not enough for you to just get data from here to there, but you don't want to modify it on the way, we have two blog posts with examples on how to do that as well. Uh, people are escaping, and I also want to get uh, to the party in time, so... If you guys have any questions, we can move to that section. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> it's all in real time. We're all in a hurry. <laughs> yes? So I'm, I'm new to this, but um, just to clarify, so you would still need something like Golden Gate on top of Oracle to then use the Kafka connector? You need to get data out of Oracle somehow. Yeah. And Kafka itself is not very good at parsing read logs. Uh, so you need, basically Golden Gate wrote a connector for Kafka. Uh, Attunity, DBVisit, a bunch of companies, big and small, wrote those connectors. You need, you'll need one of them. You'll need someone who knows how to parse Oracle read logs and put them into a format uh, that others can understand in Kafka. Thank you. And it's yes. the responsibility of that component to filter. I don't want everything coming from the Oracle database. I only want certain things. So filtering can happen in a bunch of places. If I go back to this slide, you can definitely filter here, and then it's the responsibility of the connector. You can filter here once it's in Kafka, because Kafka storage is very cheap, and you can also, also tell Kafka, only store the data in this topic for like 10 minutes while I'm filtering it. So you can also do the filtering in Kafka, or you can do filtering on the way out. So you, you basically have a bunch of options here. Yes? When on the projects you've been working on, then who really owns this after you've implemented it? And then who's kind of driving the initiative? Is it really IT-centric or the DBAs maintaining it? it? I have to say I've seen everything because it's new technology. Different companies do different stuff. Probably most common is to have a data, data scientist, like an analyst, who needed to write a report. He found out that he doesn't have all the data. He say the DBAs don't give him all the access he needs. He says, darn it, <laughs> adds Kafka, adds a bunch of connectors, writes his thing, and then he kind of owns it for life until he finds someone else to take over. And he, they usually, like th those are my favorite customers because they buy support. They have no intention of trying to maintain Kafka on their own. And that's pretty common model. Like someone with a problem created a system and then everyone has to figure out how to support it. Uh, we've also seen, in many cases, a data warehouse group that uh, owns Kafka. Um, let's see, for example, Activision, which is a video game company, uh, they needed a lot of data in the data warehouse that was uh, not available in to traditional ETL tools. And they also wanted the data warehouse to span Oracle and Hadoop. So they kind of ended up with Kafka just as a way to integrate the whole thing and the data warehouse because they're the one with the pain ended up owning it. 
usually with way better results than the data scientists owning it because they're used to owning production systems. They do a good job of it. And then I've also seen companies where they end up with a dedicated pipeline team. So if you are, for example, Uber, uh, having this real-time data pipeline is so important and so critical to the way you do business. And you have so many different consumers, so many different producers that you really need a team to own that. Uh, but that's relatively rare and just for pretty large companies. I think uh, whether it's a data science team that ends up with Kafka or data warehouse is usually the common scenario. And I think it works out better if the, the, sooner the, the sooner the data warehouse team takes control, the better it is for everyone involved. Because letting that data scientists maintain a production system is not fun for not for the users of the production system and not for the data scientists. And nobody is really happy with this scenario. Here's a really fun question you probably always get: security. Yeah. So Kafka actually has pretty good security and contributed by half by Hortonworks and half by IBM. Uh, so Hortonworks contributed SSL, uh, both for authentication and encryption. So you can say the producers use SSL to encrypt data written to Kafka and the consumers <coughs> use SSL to encrypt data on the way out. Uh, there is Kerberos, which is like the favorite Hadoop uh, authentication method. So that's also supported. And then uh, IBM ended a bunch of other mechanisms including things like, uh, let's see if I can remember, uh, they have plain text, just username, password, authentication, and they have some kind of a mobile authentication where you take a picture of something on your screen in order to authenticate. I'm not 100% certain how it's supposed to work, but they have their own big insight system. It's built, it's built on top of the Kerberos APIs, like something called Just Protocol and it's configured in a similar way, but it's actually completely its own implementation. It has no Kerberos server involved at all. It's something really, really weird, and nobody else really understands it except for IBM. Um, the, the username and password on the other hand, we all get. <laughs> um, and then we all, because once you authenticate, that's nice, but uh, what do you do with the authentication? We have ACLs. So you can say those users belong to that role. This role can read those topics, can write to those topics, can, is allowed to create new topics, not allowed to create new topics. So we have some uh, ability to control things around that. Is the ACL JSON based? Yes, the ACLs are JSON based. Uh, both Cloudera and Hortonworks allow, have uh, integration with their own ACL management system. So Cloudera has something called Sentry. Hortonworks has something called Ranger, I think. Use your to use those. Uh, I think you could actually. As far as I know, uh, because of the way development works, Sentry integrates a bit better with the latest Kafka than it is with the ones that uh, <laughs> Caldera con con currently ships. So it's a bit weird. Uh, but in general, it should integrate. It's, uh, it's supposed to be all pluggable. Good to go. I go have some uh, uh, coffee before the party or something. Yeah.